Thank you very much and, and thanks for having me um, here today. I, I guess I would start by saying I'm not um, necessarily a, a mapping um, legend. I'm, I'm not a legend at anything and I'm certainly um, not a data legend. I'm a pharmacist originally and, and very much just into health system strengthening. Um, so I've kind of stumbled into this role in, in a lot of ways to meet just a need that we had around health supply chains. Um, so hopefully there's not too many techie questions, but this is my favourite question of all. What does Tupaya mean? Um, Tupaya was a Pacific Islander. He, he um, was a navigator who joined Captain Cook's crew in 1769 um, and sailed with Captain Cook uh, through the Pacific, helping them find islands that they didn't know uh, existed. And in a lot of cases, which Tupaya himself hadn't even been to, but just knew of their existence and was able to find them um, using the stars, bird life, um, and wave patterns. Um, he died on his way back to Europe in 1770. I always say he died of, the record shows he died of malaria or dysentery. Um, but those two diseases don't resemble each other at all. So I suspect he just died of something. Um, and, uh, and that's what they wrote down. Um, so it's kind of named in his honour. And it's a data aggregation analysis and visualisation platform that allows us to overlay um, different uh, health data sources um, and present them in a mapping-led um, format. So we have a data collection app, like everyone does, um, that allows a single data entry for HIS um, or um, what we call package of essential health services or other clinic assessments, and we can route it from that app into um, different databases. But our preferred um, source for data is, is just passive data that exists already in HIS databases, uh, or in LMIS, uh, logistics management information systems, um, so stock management for pharmacy and, and consumables. The idea um, is, is to break down data silos. The idea for Tupaya came out of a concept that um, I was working in Solomon Islands in 2008 and um, this DFAT uh, consultant came up and said that she'd just come back from a clinic in Western Province that had no drugs. Um, and we were, <laughs> well, I was like, what clinic was it, you know? Well, you know? And she said, oh, well, I don't, I can't remember the name of the clinic. We went to a few, but this one didn't have any, you know, any medicines. I said, well, it must have had some medicines. You know, they've usually got some when you go, like which ones did it have and which ones did it not? She didn't know, they hadn't made a record, but could we do something about it um, in the pharmacy division? Um, <laughs> and this is very, very common. I mean, that was, that was kind of a funny and extreme example, but we constantly had people coming in and, and telling us about some problem that they'd found in some clinic. There was a very poor record of it. They'd looked at one item and it wasn't available, couldn't tell us anything more, and we were supposed to be running um, the supply chain. Um, but not only that, not just making sure stock was on the shelf properly, but it was being used properly, that um, staff had been trained in how to use these medicines, that patients were receiving what you were supposed to receive for it, and generally that the usage of medicines matched the, um, the epidemiology in the country, none of which we had any data about. Uh, we didn't even have a list of facilities in Solomon Islands at the time. We, we do now. Um, so th that was the idea, to break down those data silos and create a single source for that sort of um, information. Um, but also to do it as a regional platform. And that appeals to multilateral donors like DFAT and UNICEF and WHO and these groups um, across things like uh, disaster response, um, disease outbreak tracking, um, obviously um, health supply chains um, and other things like medicines quality. Or well, the other one is service provision, the quality of service provision. A facility is supposed to be providing X, to what level are they providing that, um, that service? Um, and we can provide that in tailored ways, so it can, it can detect who is logged in and present them a different dashboard to, um, to someone else logging in. And it is now free and open source. It's always been free, but actually when we applied to speak at this conference, it wasn't open source. So I kind of, um, I did explain that um, to the conference organisers. Um, but since then, actually just a couple of weeks ago, we've released the platform open source. The data is not openly available because this is data that we collect with the permission of governments and we have data sharing agreements with them um, that are quite specific about what we're allowed to share and what we're not. We, we do share publicly the location of facilities, their opening hours, the services that they provide and the staff that work there. But we have, you know, like over half a million data points on all sorts of things um, about these facilities. And a lot of that information is obviously quite sensitive and governments don't want us to just publicly put it out there. But we try to, we try to expose as much as we can. Um, otherwise, everything is kind of password protected at various tiers of, of access. Um, this is our current state. It's in six countries at the moment, some of which you may have heard of, some of which not. Kiribati, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Tonga, Cook Islands and Tokelau. Um, 
It's a mapped approximately 900 health facilities so far. We've had 14,000 surveys submitted through the app, but as I say, we also collect data from, um, from other sources. Um, and primarily those sources are M Supply, M Supply Mobile, and DHIS2 for those of you who are work in health systems. Um, we've won a couple of awards. I suspect sometimes we're the only people that apply to, for those awards. I, um, the, this is the URL. If you really want to help us out today, um, go and visit it and have a look. Donors love um, site hits, so, um, so get your mobiles out and, um, and go to tupai.org. But, um, but if you want to know more about the project, obviously info.tupai.org um, um, sits behind that and kind of describes a little bit more um, about the project. Um, this slide is probably a remnant for people who are really interested in health supply chains. This is one of our key sources of data and we partnered with M Supply, uh, which is a New Zealand company from the start um, uh, to, to do Tupaya. M Supply is used in about 30 countries around the world, so it's, it's a lot bigger than Tupaya. Um, they have just actually converted from being a private company to a not-for-profit. They've now just started the M Supply Foundation and moved all their IP across into that. Amazing um, bunch of people over in New Zealand. Um, but I probably don't need to talk to it too much. This is um, our basic architecture. I'll talk to kind of like the bird's eye view on this. Please don't ask me any specific questions that aren't literally on this slide because I get a little lost in the details um, that sit behind that. But this is how it's set up. So we have multiple um, and various sources feeding data into Tupaya. And the interesting part of that, I guess, is um, what is Tupaya. So we use an aggregation server to kind of pull all that data together, which is a DHIS2 instance. DHIS2 is, um, is a big open source um, HIS project run by the University of Norway, I think, in Oslo. Um, and, and so we use that to kind of pull everything together. We then run it through a config server um, just to kind of do some of the analysis that um, DHIS2 can't. And then the front end is a, is a React front end. Um, we use Mapbox and OpenStreetMap and um, all our stuff is done through uh, Leaflet. Um, but that's kind of the boring part. The more interesting part is what do we, what do we mean by like this? What, how, how does the data get used? What do we mean by data visualisation? This is an example of some supply chain data that we pulled out of Solomon Islands. This is just a, just a dump out of their um, stock management um, software and all this data is, is largely correct. It's interesting, um, someone who's running that supply chain would be interested in the minutiae of this information and may well like to work with the spreadsheets, but mostly not. Um, and that is just incomprehensible to most people. This is the availability of various medicines across um, you know, 300 facilities. This is, this is one way we visualise it. So we would sit down with the health supply chain manager. I don't know if this is a laser pointer, but... Um, but um, and, we, and this is a heat map of medicines availability in Solomon Islands. So the top um, uh, province up there is a province called Choisel. They're performing really, really well. Lots of green, everything looks good. Geographically, the province of Isabel, just here, is very, very similar. In fact, it's closer to the capital, Honiara, which is just here. So you would expect it to have better medicines availability. But because we can visualise the data really nicely, we can pick out a little bottleneck there. And that's something that we can work with the provincial pharmacy officer on in targeting that area. They've got very, very limited resources, but they do have some resources to go and do touring, provide extra training, maybe there's a transport problem. Um, and this allows us to kind of get to the heart of that um, problem through visualisation. Um, this is working fridges. So f with this, we would go to the national cold chain manager who's putting together their annual plan of, um, of which facilities will they get to. They're never going to get to every facility in a year, so we could work with them and say, up in, uh, we'll say in Western Province here, around Gizo, there's a little cluster. A really, really efficient trip for one of your maintenance teams would be to go and address that cluster there of, of fridges that aren't working, um, rather than spreading yourself really thinly, say, over Malaita Province, um, which would be an inefficient trip. Um, not to say that they're necessarily going to set all their plans you know, from a map, but it does allow you to sit down with them and, and um, make sure they're making kind of good decisions. Uh, this is what I was talking about, the quality of service provision. So this actually comes out of Tonga, um, and this data is probably an example of more sensitive data, so um, please don't take photos of this data. We do have permission to show these slides at presentations, but not sort of permission to share this data more widely. So this is services that facilities in Tonga are supposed to be providing, and this is the level to which they're providing it. Now, they use a traffic light system, um, which is really simple to, to comprehend, um, and we really like it. Um, now you can see there's obviously there's a lot of oranges and reds but behind each one of them sits an action plan um, and in each of those action plans it describes well what do they have to do 
um, to reach a certain, um, you know, well, to, to flip to green basically. Is it new staff? Is it staff training, infrastructure, um, equipment, or, or whatever else? Um, so we can then help them to visualise that. Uh, and this chart here um, summarises that uh, for all of Tonga. And it takes all of those action plans and aggregates them into a single chart that says, what are the action plans saying about flipping all these services to green? And at the moment, the bang for the buck in Tonga is staff training. It's not in recruiting new staff. It's not in infrastructure. The biggest bang for the buck is in staff training. So we can sit down with the Ministry of Health. In fact, in this case, the World Bank sits down with the Ministry of Health and helps them do their long-term um, spending plans based around this. It's not to say that you don't invest in infrastructure. It's just to say the, the weight of spending over the next three to five years should be on staff training. Um, that's a super useful way for them to, to target their resources you know, to tangible kind of outcomes. Uh, this shows the availability of inpatient beds across facilities in, uh, in a couple of provinces in Solomon Islands. Um, this is useful more for disaster response. So if, for example, you had a tsunami down on the southern coast of Malaita, this would help an incoming disaster response team, a medical response team, usually coming out of Australia in, in the case of the Pacific, to identify where they can route um, mass casualties to. Um, we've also got a new functionality coming that, that um, so we have a disaster response portal and we're kind of improving it. One will kind of show if a facility has been lost, what is the impact of that and do they need to set up, for example, a field hospital. This was first deployed after Cyclone Gita in Tonga earlier this year um, and it actually helped Australian um, response teams who were literally loading planes in Darwin to stand down because the data showed actually the impact on facilities was not as great as was feared um, and that managed to save Australia a lot of money, get us um, a, lot of, a lot of nice attention at the time. So that was, um, so that was, that was a really kind of uh, practical example of, of data use. And then there's all sorts of other things, um, but I won't go through them um, necessarily with you. We have a social health feed. This is a way to um, encourage data collection. We've tried to gamify our data collection app. Um, we call it Facebook for healthcare workers. Um, so it's got an automatic news feed. When you uh, submit a survey, complete a survey, it appears in the feed and then we can put content into that feed. Um, we can also push notifications to people through the app to say, for example, there's a diarrheal outbreak near you. These are the steps you should take to, um, to act on that. And uh, my favourite part of the app, you can earn coconuts and pigs for collecting data and there's a leaderboard of who's got the most, um, <laughs> who's got the most coconuts. Um, the idea being to kind of create a community around data. There's a big problem with health sectors in that we're constantly asking primary healthcare workers to collect data which they never see again. It just routes up and it never comes back down. So the idea was to try and build a community around it so they kind of feel part of it. Um, like all these things, Tapira is a, is a partnership between um, a whole heap of agencies but mostly funded by DFAT, um, probably 90% probably funded by, um, by DFAT um, through the Innovation Exchange. And that is that. I think that leaves... Is that right on timing? Um, about yeah, a couple of minutes yeah. for questions. Anyway, thanks. Yeah, we try to um, we try to partner with them, well, with a whole range of organisations as much as possible. SPC were actually super useful. SPC have got um, a whole arm called uh, Data for Development, I think it's called. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Legendary guys. There's a, there's a guy there, Phil Bright, who I don't think we would have got this up without some of his advice. Um, so we've shared all our um, all the data that we can share, we've given to them. And so, um, for example, facility locations is now all data that they um, host on their maps. For those of you who haven't seen it, I actually sent Phil an email saying he should be here. Because SPC's maps of the Pacific services, health, education, but census data in particular, they're just unbelievably rich data sources. Yeah, they're really, um, they're really good. But, um, but I increasingly our engagement with SPC is, I guess, more around acting on the data rather than we don't so much do active stuff with Phil at the moment. Although they're about to, um, SPC is about to release their population, like their census data through like publicly facing APIs, which has been kind of in the works for a while. At the moment, our population data is pretty weak. It's basically based on going to facilities and asking what is your catchment population. Um, we'd like to do that more dynamically by, by just pulling in the, from the census data from SPC. So. 
fingers crossed. It was supposed to be by the end of the year, but I don't know where they're up to with it. So, yeah. 